Hi, Brian. How are you? Very well, thank you. Thank uh, you for talking to me as well. It's a it's a pleasure to talk to you. I I can only imagine. I mean, you know, even just being able to look at this collection of of music, which I'm excited to talk about, and uh, and just to think about everything you have been up to throughout your career. You know, I mean, it involves a lot of collaboration, a lot of being in different places. I can't imagine the the change in your life since the pandemic started. <laughs> Such a relief. <laughs> I hate to say it, but uh, I know I know it's been a terrible experience for a lot of people, but it's been quite a nice experience for me. What do you mean? Well, suddenly my whole diary emptied, like everybody else's. Everything was cancelled, and I thought, oh, good. Well, <laughs> it's like having a forced holiday. <laughs> I'm never very good at taking holidays, and suddenly I had no choice. You know, I, um, I, I talked to some folks and, you know, who had ex- expectations that during these months they'd write the great American novel or, or they'd finally make that record they, they were planning on making for the longest time. And some of them did it, but most of them said they had a hard time being creative during this whole thing. How did you find it? Um, for the first two or three months, I didn't even try. I just thought I'll see what it's like not to go to work every day because normally I work every day go into my studio and work on things well I didn't have a studio because I I moved out to the countryside I have a house in the country here and so for two or maybe three months I didn't do anything at all and um, that's the first time in my adult life actually that I've I've done that or I've done nothing really Um, how was it and it, it was refreshing yeah. Because well, one of the odd things that happened was that I started listening to music again. Um, now it sounds funny to say that, but if you're if you're a working on music every day, you don't listen to a lot of music. You only listen to what you're working on. And um, I suddenly discovered that I I rediscovered that I love music. I love listening to it as well. What, what were you listening to? Oh well. It was, it was interesting. I had I was using this little app that you can get on your phone called Radio Garden. I really recommend. Idea, it's a map of the world, a globe, and uh, the globe is covered with tiny little green dots, and each of those green dots is a radio station, and. If you click on the dot, you hear what is playing on that station at that moment. And to suddenly discover the world is seething with fascinating music. Spend, you know, 20 minutes in um, Lagos and then to flip to Darwin and then to go to central Russia and then to try what see what's happening in Mongolia. Um, and so it was so interesting, and I, I particularly enjoyed one station I found, which was um, it's called Cheboksari. It comes from Central Russia, and it broadcasts nothing but Orthodox chant day and night, seven days a week. And I have never heard a single announcement on it yet. It just goes from one piece of music to the next, and that um, Orthodox chant really, really seemed to resonate with the countryside of where I am now. I'm in a very flat um, part of England and the east coast of England. And that music just seemed to make such a lot of sense here. Such a lot of sense. Orthodox chant from Russia. It, 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 t- tell me more about how it made sense. I'm dying to know. Well, it sounds like music. Maybe I'm imagining this, but it sounds like music that's made for big, flat landscapes and huge skies. It's very, very celestial and very heavenly in sound. Um, and it's very slow. It, you know, very often you'll hear someone singing on one note, a lot of words, and then they'll just change to another note right at the end of, the, of a long line. Like a cantor um, in church, you know. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly like that. Yes. It's, it's, it's very, very sedate. And, uh, and yet, um, because some of the scales that are used are quite unusual, it's it's very exotic to our ears. They they in some of them they're using sort of Oriental scales that are not very familiar to us. Like modes, are they like Mixolydian modes or something yeah. like that? 
Yes, but they're rather they're not the classical church modes that we use. They're not the they're they're some of the older Greek modes, which have um, half half note and quarter note intervals in them. So they they're quite odd, some of them. I have to tell anyway. you, it, it's lovely to hear you talk about it in a visual way, you know, like it's, it's <laughs> lovely to hear you to talk about music and say, oh, you know, why, why, why was that perfect? And you said, because I can sort of imagine a very, you know, visual, you know, very flat landscape. I love, I yeah. love it because it, because it does put in mind your, your film scoring a little bit and perhaps how you might see music relating to a, a place or, or, or something visual. Yes. Yes. Well, I think that's, that's very often what I'm doing. When I start working on a film piece, a soundtrack or a documentary, I don't really want to see the film at the beginning. I want to know where it is and what the sort of emotional world of the thing is. And then I like to start working, if I can, before I see any visuals at all. I don't really want to, I, I want to imagine the place um, before I see it sort of thing. You don't see the film? Um, I've sometimes I've done some soundtracks without seeing the film at all. Um, others I've seen the film later on in the process. So I've started working, and um, I've got several pieces going, and then I see the film. But I I work in a kind of odd way. In the deal I usually make with um, filmmakers is I say to them, I'm going to make a lot of music and give it to you, and you can do what you like with it. <laughs> <laughs> and of course, I, it's not doctrinaire. I don't say, and you'll never hear from me again. Um, <laughs> <laughs> just send the money. <laughs> <laughs> no, what, what I normally say is, um, I'll make a lot of music. You try fitting it to the film. And then if you need things sort of um, cut and, you know, what do they say, nip and tuck in fashion when you when you sort of, fit it to the film better i can i do that sometimes how different but, is how different is that than when you're working with another musician say like you're working with a director on their vision versus working with another musician on their vision well it's it's fairly different actually because if you're working with another musician they they're constantly throwing things in that sort of push you into different directions that surprise you basically um and it's it's a live, ongoing thing, you know, that, that uh, the, you have to react in the moment if you're playing with somebody else. Um, so that, that sort of bypasses a tendency that um, one might have to over-plan and over-intellectualise. You have to respond immediately. And sometimes, because it's live, if you're working with somebody, your immediate response is possibly much braver and bolder than you would make if you had time to think about it. Your immediate response might be a huge mistake, in fact, and then, then you have to try to somehow argue your way out of the mistake you've just made musically. There's, a, there's something to be said about presence there, you know. There's all this. I was watching the television the other night. I was watching the election, and I saw that the the election, ironically, was um, the coverage on CNN was sponsored by Calm, the meditation app, which seems <laughs> seems very <laughs> <laughs> seems appropriate, you know. <laughs> but it reminded me of a, of a conversation I had one time. And I'll tell you something about me, and I won't talk about myself that much. But I, I play uh, traditional music from where I'm from in Newfoundland and Labrador. And and quite often uh -huh. I find myself playing traditional Irish music at sessions. I play I play sessions and yes. large yes. and I and because I accompany I'm, I'm I largely improvise uh, accompaniment, and mm -hmm. I I do sometimes think that when I'm improvising or when I'm playing music with somebody, it, it, I don't need those apps. That is when mm -hmm. I'm my, my most present. That is when I'm fully yeah. in the moment. And you're right. Even if I make a mistake, I can usually figure my way out of it. You know. Yes, yes. Well, it's exciting because. Um, I'm always looking for ways, in fact, I always have been looking for ways to push myself outside of the envelope of sort of habitual behavior or of my normal taste or the way I normally do things. So I, I think habits are useful and they have a role, but it's also good to think of ways of breaking them. And one way of breaking them is to play with other people. Um, 
they just they just do things that you have to respond to and you don't have a habitual response to that you know you have to come up with something new but i i am um, also when i'm working alone i set up funny rules for myself um depending on what what day it is and what what i feel like doing like what I just make rules. oh sometimes they're complicated things uh like i say I'm going to have a major event happening at 12 randomly chosen points in the in the course of a piece of music. And then I think of some way of randomly choosing those points. And, and that becomes the sort of skeleton of the piece of music. And for instance, a piece that I made like that was um, the piece I made with Bowie called Warsaw. That was, that was done exactly like that. I just drew out a chart and uh, I threw dice to see when the changes, the important musical changes would be in the piece. Um, and it created a structure that you just wouldn't have ever arrived at by intuition. You know, you, your taste wouldn't have taken you to there because there are sometimes long still sections and then three fast changes, then another still section. Um, you just wouldn't. You wouldn't do that, I think, as a composer normally. Or another another sort of rule might be to say, okay, I'm sitting at a keyboard, but I'm not going to use the middle two octaves at all. Mm. So I'm I'm just going to be working at the extremes of the keyboard. Mm -hmm. These these things, there's nothing particularly magical about these things, but they're just ways of moving you somewhere that you wouldn't have have gone to intuitively we, we can be under the false impression that ultimate freedom is what we're looking for when we're making something but really it's it can be limits that allow us to make interesting art i wonder if say if you're working say if you're working on like a, a song that's meant to be a top 40 record say if you're working with coldplay or you're working with youtube or something like that mm -hmm. is that a limit too like, oh, I, I want to make something and I, I, I want to make it within the realm of something that could play it on, on BBC One on, in pop radio. I think, I think, as you suggest, all limits are pretty interesting and useful. I mean, making film music is, is a, a very interesting sort of set of limits because, first of all, the film exists. Yeah. So you can't do just about, you can't do anything you feel like. It's got to have some relationship to the film. So... So you're sort of given a skeleton by that. Um, and of course, then you have time considerations. You have the important consideration that you don't want the music to overwhelm the dialogue, for example. The music mustn't be too interesting in the sense of, <laughs> well, it mustn't really. You're right, the, you're right. The interesting, it's like, it's like if you have an... A, an accompanist who is who is always fiddling around instead of letting the singer do the just, uh, occupy the foreground. You know, um, you you just have to accept that your role in that situation is to enhance, to support, and that's a thoroughly decent and respectable job. You don't have to be the person out in the front the whole time, but but those kinds of limitations are, and of course the most important limitation is a deadline <laughs> that's always that's always the one i respond best to otherwise i'd never finish anything <laughs> is that is that your most important job when making music for a film is is supporting i think i i was thinking about this the other day and a lot of film music exists to underline the emotions that are already there. So if it's a sad scene, then the tinkly high piano yeah. and the violin comes out. And I thought, I don't really like underlining things. I like undermining them. What do you mean? I, well, I, I like to make, to increase the ambiguity of something, I think, to make it more more puzzling like if it's very sweet i want to add some bitterness if it's very sad i want to add some hope if it's very hopeful i want to add some doubt i i want to make it um i guess more like real life actually because real life has very few undiluted emotions you know there there's nearly always something else in the back of your mind 
And this is one of the reasons that I prefer to work initially without seeing the film, because the film very clear, very often has a very clear picture of where, where it's going. And what is interesting is sometimes when you put something with it that isn't completely compatible, which suddenly opens up another feeling in the film. I mean, for my best example of this is um, Nino Rota, who's one of the great film composers who did a lot of the Fellini films. Um, and what's very interesting about his work is that it's sort of a separate story that is going on. The film is going on and you're watching it and so on. But then there's this other voice, which is Nino Rota's voice, which is sort of saying, but you could think this, or it could be like that. Or there's, there's a sense of multiplying the number of um, paths that the film is taking. Does that ever... Do you ever come up against a director then who might have a bit more of a didactic vision, like, oh, I, you know, no, I want this to be sad, Brian? Um, those kind of directors don't often contact me. Right, right. <laughs> I, I thought, I thought that might be the answer. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I have, I've got nothing against people who make that kind of music or who make those kinds of demands. I just don't want to be particularly a part of that, you know. Um, I, I, uh, I, I basically like making music and then sticking it onto a film and seeing what happens. I mean, I, when I was younger, when I had a television, which was about 40 years ago, I used to enjoy watching TV, but putting my own music to the action on the screen. So just trying different pieces of music. And I was always fascinated by how how radically you could change the feeling of what was going on on the screen. You turn the sound down and you put on a record and you suddenly see that those people are doing something different depending on which music is, is accompanying them. So I, I always like to take that role of saying, I'll be the, I'll be the difference really. It brings to mind, my father would tell me stories when he was growing up, they would bring in, um, of course, they would play. They would play old movies, you know, and, and oftentimes they'd be silent movies. And what I love about this is that I think about you know the piano player and the silent movie being something out of a western. But this happened in his his lifetime, you know. And I have often wondered how. And now that you mention it, how much did that gentleman who just happened to live in the community, who happened to know <laughs> how to play the piano, impact yeah. how everybody saw that movie? Yes. And, and how different that movie must have been when it went to another town <laughs> with a different piano player. Yes. Ah, yeah, something about the power of it, you know? D yeah. But uh, do you remember, I mean, there's lots to be said about early film scores that might have that might have knocked you out a little bit, but like, just, do you remember early memories of just going to the movies? Yes. Yes, I do. Though I can't say that I really started separating out the musical experience from the whole experience yeah. until I was probably in my late teens or something like that. That was when I started to notice that film music was something different. It was, um, it was a different kind of music actually. Um, partly because of what we were saying earlier where, because the film music is there not to be the center generally, it's there to be the surround. And, um, I found that I really enjoyed that kind of music with its center missing. So I liked music without a center. This, this was a very important realization to me early on when I first started working that you could have music that didn't have a narrative and didn't, didn't have a central figure or central voice in it. Um, and I saw this same transition in painting. You know, if you think of the transition from classical painting to um, impressionism and everything that followed impressionism what you sort of see was the in that was the dissolving of the center of the picture the picture spread out to become an all-over experience rather than if you think of you know a famous painting like the Mona Lisa she's clearly the whole center of the thing and there's, there's a kind of background filled in with some mountains and trees but but clearly the attention is her um, 
So I always used to think when I was young, looking at paintings like Mona Lisa, I'd love to see what just the landscape was like, because I loved the landscape in that particular picture. Um, and I sort of sometimes wished that she wasn't there so I could just look out of the window <laughs> instead and not see her sitting on the windowsill. Um, but it made me think that music had really got itself into a new position by the 70s, which was that because of the way we were making music, that's to say in multi-track studios and building it up track by track, what that process is much more like painting than it is like classic, like traditional ways of making music. For a start, it wasn't live really. You know, you could work on something one day, come back the next day, take off the thing you'd done on the first day and um, you'd build a thing up over time rather than through performance, which we normally think of with music. And so I started to think that lots of analogies that were to do with painting actually applied to music. And that's really the way I've been making music ever since then. Um, when you asked me earlier a question I didn't answer, I just remembered um, about, you know, the limitation of making a record that ought to appear on the radio, as it were. Um, that also is very interesting because you sort of then think, so who are you making it for? What situation are they in when they're hearing it? What time of year does it come out? That's quite important. Some songs really are summer songs and yeah. some of them feel winter songs, you know. Yeah. Um, the Christmas number one is a big deal, I know, you know. Yes, exactly. Yeah. And and there are certain songs that would not make a Christmas number one. They're, they'd make a great summer hit. You know, think of Macarena, for example, that great song. <laughs> A fabulous song in the summer, but you can't imagine that coming out at Christmas. Period, you don't you, you don't want to be putting your coat on and shivering and hearing Desposito or the Macarena on in the background, do you? I just love that right. you love the Macarena. That's not something I would have had in my, my Brian Eno bingo card, to be honest. Oh yeah, that's that's a big record for me. <laughs> <laughs> um I, let, let me talk a little bit more about about broad appeal. I'll just 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 take a listen to this. Sent uh, originally from the soundtrack of the documentary Apollo. It's since been used in other films by directors like Steven Soderbergh and Danny Boyle and the new Brave New World TV adaptation. My, my guest today is Brian Eno, whose film music 1976 to 2020 is out now. I'll say a couple of things. One, I loved, I, I glanced up while we were listening to it, and I, I loved that you were listening to it too. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> if that seems silly, like sometimes you play the songs for people and they're kind of like, oh, all right, you know, yeah, but, but <laughs> it, was, it was nice to see that you were. You seem to you seem to have heard something in it, and it's nice to see. You know. Well, what was interesting was that because I'm hearing it through through a computer, it was being changed in a quite interesting way. Mm. Uh, it sounded like the kind of processing I might apply to a piece of music um, done spontaneously by my computer and this Zoom system. Eighty three million listens to that piece of music on Spotify. Um, do you I'm know? 79 million of those. <laughs> <laughs> you have an algorithm going, just playing it over and over and over. Have it going the whole time, yeah. <laughs> That's a good scam here. That's a good scam. I have, I have all these bot farms in Russia that <laughs> playing that piece over and over. <laughs> Do you have any idea when you, when you've made something that might have broad appeal like that? Um, I knew that was a good piece when I made it. Yeah. I never have any idea how many other people are going to like something. I mean, some, sometimes I do something and I think that is definitely going to be popular. 
Um, and sometimes I'm completely right and other times I'm not. And I have no way of knowing really wh when it's not correct. And then other times I do things and I think, well, that, that isn't going to be popular, but I like it anyway, so I'm going to release it. Um, and are you ever surprised? Are you, are, do you ever have things that you think this will never be popular and then it is? Yes. Yes, I, I have had that um, happen where, for instance, I, you're talking about 83 million plays. I, somebody sent me a YouTube link to something I made and there were millions of plays on it, on, on the YouTube. I can't remember now which piece it was. And I thought, that's not a piece I would have expected to be very popular. You, you just can't tell, really. There's, there's a sort of snowball effect, you know, when, when something starts to get heard and then people send links to other people and they hear about it. It, it doesn't necessarily reflect any intrinsic properties of the piece, <laughs> but just its stickiness, cultural stickiness. Do you have anything you set out to do when you write a piece of music? Or, or is it all... Now, I was about to use the word generative. You're the only person on the world I shouldn't use the word generative when it comes to because you have. <laughs> <laughs> I just realized that that generative music is vi it actually has a definition. But um, when you're are you are you ever setting out to do anything when you write a piece of music, or is it purely just something that comes out along the way? Um, I think what I'm nearly always setting out to do is to make something that I want to hear. Now that that sounds sort of stupid and trivial, but but actually that's that's really the key for me. When I'm listening to music, other people's music as well. When I'm listening in general, I'm thinking, oh, I really like that aspect of this, and I'm not so keen on that aspect. But this this thing is a really good idea. And then I think, what would happen if you took that idea a little bit further? Wouldn't that be nice if a kind of music exists that was more like that? Um, I'm being very vague here about what I mean, but for instance, um, really ambient music came out of listening to other music and finding little pieces within that, spaces within the music and thinking, God, I wish there was something that went on for a long time like that. Um, for instance, one of the first important things in that for me was realizing that I, I always preferred the slow movements in string quartets. I liked string quartet. I liked the sound of a string quartet, but I didn't really care for the fast movements that much. They, they were sort of athletic and a bit frantic for me. Um, so my friend Peter Schmidt, the painter, made me a cassette once of all the slow, the slow movements of the last six Haydn string quartets just one after the other. And I thought, that's what I like. I like, I don't want to have to change mood that much. I want the music to be a place that I can go to and reliably stay there for a length of time. Um, that was a big realization for me because until that time, both classical music and records were arranged on the assumption that you needed to frequently be surprised that you needed to change mood quickly, you know. So you'd have on um, pop records, they were all like the fast song and then a slow song, then the ballad, and then another fast one and so on. And that's fine, but I just didn't want that rate of change. If I want to hear fast songs, I want to hear them for hours. <laughs> and if I want to hear slow songs, I want to hear those for hours. So, so my feeling about what I wanted music to do was was very personal it was what i wanted the music i want to hear and that's always what i'm making i think i'm just trying to make music that i want to hear and because my tastes keep evolving um and because i keep hearing things that other people have done and think well that's a really good idea mm -hmm. um, so i i have to make new stuff well, I have, I have two questions left for you, and you've been very generous with your time. One, I want to go back to something we were talking about at the beginning, about collaboration and, and you know, and the difference between sitting down by yourself and writing music for a film or collaborating with someone. We were talking about the idea of presence, but I think you have, a, you have an interesting story around collaboration, and you're quite exceptional at it. So I, I did want to ask you, what's your, 
What's your advice or your rule for, for people who might be wanting to, do, uh, to make something new with somebody else? Is there an unbreakable rule around a successful collaboration in your world? Hmm, that's quite a difficult question because any rule that I can think of, I can also think of exceptions <laughs> to. Where, where you've broken it. Well, for, for example, you would think that a good rule would be people who know how to listen to each other. You'd think that that would be an invariably important aspect of collaboration. But actually, it isn't necessarily so. There are people who are hopeless at listening to other people, but sometimes those other people will just support them. Huh? I'm only joking. I'm only joking. I'm only joking. <laughs> <laughs> well, you must know this as an accompanist. I, I, there are some, some people who listen to what you're doing and others who don't at all. They I think some of them are still playing. playing and they don't know that I've gone, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> but you were saying, so, 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 right. So they're, they're right there. That's a rule. You would think that people who can listen. I would also think that people who are open, people who are open-minded, you can bring anything yeah. to them. You, you often hear that as a, as, a, as a great rule for collaboration, but I, I bet you've come across the, where that's, that hasn't worked too. I can think of cases where that hasn't worked, where, where there are people who are not at all open-minded, who are very good at um, somehow creating. I think Van Morrison is an example, actually. He's somebody who's brilliant at creating the circumstances from which great music arises. But I, I have no reason to believe he's open-minded at all. I think he's absolutely doctrinaire about what he wants um, and, and doesn't really want anyone to piss around with it, you know. Yeah, yeah. Um, but I, I suppose one thing that in, in my experience that makes a really big difference in collaborations is sense of humour. That is a hugely important thing. If you can, um, if you can laugh with somebody else, that makes everything easier. It's, mm. it's like a lubricant, you know. You, if you can joke, it also means that you're not taking yourself too seriously, and that's quite important. Was was, forgive me. Was Bowie funny? The funniest person you can imagine in the studio. Really, he, he was very very funny. Yes. Um, um, we used to have a thing that I, I don't know if you've ever seen Peter Cook and Dudley Moore. This was an English, a couple of English comedians mm -hmm. who had a great um, couple of characters they played. Well, David and I spent a lot of our time in those characters. And, <laughs> um, and it's very funny if I think about it now, some of the, some of the most sort of moving and serious music that, came out of those sessions we did was accompanied by us arsing around in these strange characters that we took on. He was very, he was a very good mimic. Um, in fact, it's interesting how several of the best singers I know are also very good mimics. Chris Martin is an incredible mimic. He's so funny um, and really, really so convincing. He can inhabit another personality. Bono is another one. Amazing mimic um, who can, he can sing in styles that are completely convincing. You think, oh yes, I know who that is. It's exactly right. So mimics, of course, are people who observe other people closely. I mean, that's, that's where I went, right? Like that's, that's what I was thinking. In order to pick up someone's nuances and, and to be able to mimic them, you have to have a keen eye for, for them, for kind of like human behavior that I think yeah. might also be the thing that leads them to be able to know how to write songs that can appeal to a lot of different people. Yeah, yeah, I think so. It, it's being intensely aware of voice and the, and the persona that goes with a voice. Um, the first time I ever worked with David, I'd just come into the studio in Paris and he said, oh, we've been, we w wrote this song for... Dylan. And I said, oh, really? That's interesting. And he, he said, yeah, I'll play it to you. And he played this song. And I thought, God, that's the best Dylan song that I've heard for years. And I was really enjoying it. And, and I looked around and, and David was laughing like mad. And it turned out it was one of his songs that he'd sung as Dylan, <laughs> but so well, so well. 
I always wish he'd released that because it's sort of out Dylan, Dylan, really. I'm sure. I'm sure it'll be tracked down, Brian. I think. I think um, it's it's been a it's been a pleasure talking to you. Um, and th- thank you so much for your time. How? What's the next thing you're going to listen to? You think now after we're done talking? I'm actually about to watch a film. Oh, fantastic film called Nine Queens. It's an Argentinian film. Um, it's a sort of heist thriller. I've seen it twice before, but I just love this film, and I managed to track down a copy. And that has a very exciting Argentinian soundtrack. So that's the next thing I'll listen to. It's been a pleasure to talk to you. And thank you so much for your time. Thank you very much. It's been a pleasure to talk to you as well. Brian Eno's Film Music 1976 to 2020 is out now.